All right. Welcome, everyone. I know some people are still whirling in, but just to be mindful of time, we are going to get started as we have a lot to discuss today. And uh, we really appreciate you all making the time to be here. This is being recorded. So, um, you know, feel free to take notes. You'll be getting a lot of great information, um, but this will also be available as a recording that will be emailed to you. Uh, sometime in the next day or so, I imagine. Um, so my name is Natalie Awish. I'm the Director of State Affairs for Animal Wellness Action. Um, and for any Pennsylvania people that might be on, I'm also Executive Director of Humane Action Pittsburgh. Um, we're going to be talking today, uh, we have some special guests with us, about transforming your world as an advocate and citizen lobbyist. Um, so I'd love to introduce my colleague at Animal Wellness Action, uh, Scott Beckstead, to give a quick intro. Hi, everyone. Scott Beckstead, Director of Campaigns for Animal Wellness Action. I am joining you from my home office in Sutherland, Oregon. Um, I have a long history of advocating for animals. It's um, uh, sort of a passion of mine. I've been doing it for pretty much my, well, I was going to say my entire adult life, but pretty much my entire life. I've been that that guy who's always uh, standing up for all the critters, um, but uh, really looking forward to a great conversation today and uh, welcome your questions. And I'd also like to introduce um, a friend of mine and wonderful friend to animals, Representative Jason Ortitai. Jason, would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be back again this year. Happy to see so many people joining us and uh, looking forward to your questions and, and having a good conversation today. And I should just also mention that um, uh, Representative Ortitai is going to be receiving the Humane Action Pittsburgh Legislator of the Year Award for 2023 um, at our upcoming gala for all of the great work that he's done for animals and specifically wildlife this session. Um, and next, I would love to pass it to Representative Gomberg. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for having me today. I really do appreciate the wonderful work Animal Wellness does, and uh, and that's also a reflection of all the wonderful work that all of your supporters are able to do. I'm David Gomberg from, uh, from the uh, Oregon Coast, House District 10, now serving in my 12th year in the Oregon Legislature. What's really interesting about that is that because we have so much turnover in, uh, in legislatures around the country, I am fourth in seniority in the Oregon House. And we can talk about that a little bit more as we get into our program, but I'm really very uh, pleased to be with all of you here today. Thank you, Representative Gomberg. Um, we have a, a fairly short um, presentation for you. Uh, Scott and I will be doing a little bit of talking, but hopefully uh, you'll mostly be hearing from the representatives since they're, of course, the true experts in how to effectively communicate with legislators. Uh, we do have time at the end for your questions. So you should see a button that says Q&A, and you're able to type your questions in there at any point in time. And then um, my wonderful colleague, Ryan, uh, we'll be fielding those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so just a quick overview of what we're talking about today. Um, I know, you know, I would assume everybody on this call is an animal advocate. And I know I started off in animal advocacy and rescue, which I imagine is what a lot of you do or are passionate about. Uh, you know, I volunteered at my local animal shelter. And of course, that's great. And that's so important. And you're really changing the world for those animals. But I thought, how can I make more of a difference? And that's when I, uh, you know, found advocacy in terms of uh, lawmaking and legislation. Um, so lawmaking is key to solving animal problems that are too big for rescue alone. And of course, we want to try to prevent uh, animal cruelty in the first place. And so by understanding the needs of animals, educating yourself and your friends and your circle of influence, and speaking up in all levels of government, um, you will do more for animal well-being than most people ever will. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, understanding why legislation and regulation are important and the general process. Um, We'll talk about uh, the skill set needed for effective communication with your legislators. You'll learn how to prevent and relieve animal suffering by lending your voice for animals. 
And of course, uh, a lot of the tools, if not all of the tools that we're talking about today really could apply to all kinds of advocacy. So I'm sure you're all animal advocates since you're here, but maybe you also have other causes you care about. And these tools should translate um, across those different sectors. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be answering some frequently asked questions, and then there will be time for uh, everyone attending to ask questions as well. So you can put those in the Q&A. So Scott, um, I'm gonna pass it to you. Can you talk a little bit more about why legislation and regulation are important? Well, sure, you know, um, and uh, I I'm reminded of how many times uh, working in the legislature uh, in Oregon, um, as well as on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., uh, how often, um, you know, people will say, so so what are you working on? And I tell them about a particular bill and they say something like, I can't believe it takes a law uh, to fix that. And, and I'm thinking uh, especially uh, we passed a bill uh, several years ago here in Oregon to ban a practice called horse tripping. Um, and this is a, a rodeo event where uh, the contestants rope the front feet of a galloping horse and trip it to make it fall face first into the dirt in the arena. And as I'm, as I'm shopping around this bill around the Oregon legislature, members of the legislature are saying, I can't believe we have to pass a law to prohibit horse tripping, but we do because people do it. And whether it's horse tripping or animal fighting or whether it is wildlife killing contests, uh, you know, we often see that societal values and norms have moved to a place, but the law hasn't evolved to catch up. And so that's why we really, you know, have to stay involved in the legislative process. Um, to uh, to address these gross uh, uh, acts of cruelty uh, that people uh, perpetrate against animals. Um, and so, you know, we can support the work that local shelters do and we can support the work that, you know, local horse rescues and so forth do. But really changing the policies and changing the laws and the regulations is the way to really get at the root of the problem. Um, and so, you know, when you are an effective uh, legislative advocate, you're not just campaigning in the halls of the legislature, you're also engaging with, uh, with the media uh, and with members of the general public, other people who care about the issue are, go uh, are going to reach out to you. Um, and so, um, so that's why we need to do this work. And it can sometimes be a slow grind. Sometimes it feels like it's two steps forward and one step back. Um, but, you know, when you've been in this uh, in this arena, uh, you know, a long time, you start getting a sense of the law of the long game. And while there are, you know, uh, disappointments along the way, when you step back and look at the overall progress, I mean, I just look at the number of bills that Representative Gomberg has, has uh, successfully gotten passed here in Oregon. And that's the kind of thing that really gives me hope because while there are setbacks and, and we see people still doing things that are terrible, there are really great lawmakers. And our job as advocates is to engage with those lawmakers and give them the support that they need, whether that's in terms of, you know, talking points and, you know, educating them on the background of the issue. So um, just to clarify what we're talking about here that, you know, we've got two state lawmakers uh, here joining us today. They work in the state capitals of their respective states. They are not in uh, in Congress on Capitol Hill. Those are your United States senators and your U.S. representative in the House of Representatives. So, um, so just keep in mind that, you know, the states pass their sets of laws. Congress passes an entirely different sets of laws. Often there's overlap. Sometimes Congress picks up what the states are doing and passes the same thing at the federal level. But we're talking uh, with two state lawmakers that are passing uh, laws for their states today. Scott, I'm gonna jump in real quick because you mentioned horse tripping, a bill I carried several years ago. Um, and that would seem to be common sense and a, a horrible practice that we want to uh, prevent. 
not everybody agrees. I uh, I just went on YouTube real quickly to look up and see if it's still there. You go on YouTube and, and look up horse tripping in Gomberg, and the first video says David Gomberg is a bigot and a pea brain who hates <laughs> Mex who hates Mexicans. So so which I guess the point being that uh, that that's why the support of good people like the ones on this call are so important because it keeps us focused when uh, when there is an a, <laughs> an alternative point of view being presented every day in the in our various legislatures. And, and I would just I would just add to that, Representative Gomberg, you know, uh, in the course of doing this work, uh, you are going to anger and offend some people who enjoy doing these terrible things and who look at it as sort of an infringement of their right to do horrible things to animals. Uh, so uh, you know, I don't I don't know who said it, but, you know, someone said that if if you're not uh, if you don't if you haven't made any enemies, it means that you haven't uh, stood up for anything important. And any anytime you do this work, uh, you can be sure that there are going to be people who develop a negative opinion about you for sure. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, I guess you really have to have a thick skin, which is one reason I would never be able to run for office. <laughs> um. Sorry, I'm trying to get my, there it is. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit pretty briefly about some of the tools for effective advocacy and lobbying. Um, we're definitely gonna be hearing from Representative Ortiz, Ty and Gomberg uh, later on to expound on some of these uh, points. Um, but first of all, of course, you wanna educate yourself on the issues. So if you go to Animal Wellness Action's website or you're signed up for our emails, um, you can find information on our priority bills to educate yourself. Remember, our representatives are dealing with, I mean, I don't even know how many hundreds and hundreds of issues and bills ranging from, you know, the budget to infrastructure and, you know, everything in between. Um, and so they are going to rely on you uh, to be able to help educate them on the issues that we care about. Um, it's so important to know who your legislators are. Um, we'll go over in a few minutes how to find these people and which ones you should know. Um, but just a couple of quick things. Um, I like to put their names and numbers in my contacts list in my phone. Um, this way, if I want to contact them, I've called their office. I don't have to, you know, Google it every single time. I just have it in there like, you know, I would call a friend. Um, you know, research issues that are important to them. Uh, we, of course, have some wonderful animal advocates here today with Representative Ortiz and Gomberg, but not all of our legislators necessarily care about animal welfare, or at least it's not top priority to them. Uh, but maybe they care about the environment, or maybe they care about lowering taxes, or other things that when you're calling about the priority bills, you can make connections, right? Animal welfare is so interconnected with so many other things. Um, get to know their staffers. You know, typically, if you're calling their office or emailing them, um, you're not necessarily going to be directly contacting the representative or the senator. Uh, so who answers the phone? Who is the person in their office that handles animal issues? Uh, you can get to know those things after you start developing a relationship. Um, and of course, uh, you know, you can always contact me uh, if you're contacting a federal representative and I'm able to uh, look at who handles their animal welfare issues and connect you with that person. Um, my email address will be available at the end of the presentation. Um, and then, you know, follow them on social media, attend their events, right? You don't want to just always be reaching out to them necessarily when you want something. So, so get to know them, let them see your face. So, you know, they know who you are. Um, Representative Ortiz, Ty, or Gomberg, before I move on, do either of you want to add anything to how your constituents can can better get to know you and connect with you? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here, Natalie. I I, I think you know that the phone calls, the meeting requests, uh, anything face to face when we're out and about for for events in the community, whether we're hosting events uh, in our offices. The, the preferred method for me is always face-to-face. -face. Uh, I, I think it just makes it easier to communicate and really get to know somebody. When you're conversing through email uh, or through social media, it's I, I think there's a lot that gets lost in translation and things can be taken either in a, in a, in a different light than intended. But I, I always prefer the face-to-face. -face. Um, and I know not all of my colleagues may agree with that, 
uh, or may not have time for that. But if you're a constituent of mine, like I owe that to you. Like that, that's what I'm here for is to listen to, to what you, your issues are, what's important to you. Uh, and in order to do that, I think face-to-face -face is the best way to facilitate that. And I'm going to echo that perspective. I mean, one of the, the themes that you're going to hear repeatedly today is that legislating, like just about everything else that we do, is all about relationships. And if you can build a relationship, then that's going to make communicating a lot easier. And the strongest way to build those relationships are, uh, are in person, but it's also important to do it when the legislature is not meeting. And oh, by the way, we can also talk about campaigns. Work hard to get people that already support your issues elected, and it's going to be easier to convince them to support a, a measure when the time comes. But those campaigns are also an opportunity to get to know somebody in a completely different environment so that you're already a friendly face when you show up in their office and are trying to encourage or discourage a vote. And I would just uh, jump in as well, uh, Natalie. I, I was recently appointed by the governor to the Oregon Racing Commission, and um, we had our very first commission meeting. Now, the Oregon Racing Commission sets policy for, uh, for the racing of horses here in Oregon. And I was appointed because I was going to be a, a voice or I'm going to be a voice for the horses themselves. And during our first commission meeting, we had a group that represents the Oregon thoroughbred breeders uh, and owners. And after their presentation, I asked, you know, do you have a policy on um, uh, on slaughter and and making sure that horses are not uh, retired race horses are not going to slaughter, but are instead are going to good homes. And do you have a policy on or some sort of program for uh, you know for you know retired racers? And um, and she didn't have a great answer for me, but she reached out to me afterward and invited me to a meeting of her and several other uh, uh, thoroughbred owners and breeders. And that to me, it was the right approach. You know, she, she knew that she wasn't necessarily prepared for my questions, but she reached out to me afterward to establish a personal relationship and, you know, made it clear that she's looking forward to addressing my concerns and talking to me and getting me familiar with sort of how they do things, as well as giving me an opportunity to share my views. So I think really that that uh, getting to know what is important to these policymakers, uh, what is important to them, what their priorities are, that is absolutely key, and using that to inform the relationship that you're going to build with them. Thank you. Of course, we want to make sure that our legislators understand that it's not just us that cares about these issues, right? And that there is a large widespread public support. Um, so you want to make sure that you can find friends, family, coworkers, right? Whoever is in your circle of influence um, to also contact the legislators um, through calls, emails. And then I have letters sometimes. Um, I know that if you're contacting Congress, uh, your federal representatives, letters can take a very, very long time to reach them because there is a, a you know, a, a pretty big security protocol that they have to go through. Um, at the state issue, uh, Representative Gomberg, what, what do you prefer? I mean, in person, it sounds like is definitely the consensus, but if that's not an option. Um... Well, certainly email is a lot more convenient for my office to handle than, um, than posted letters which we have to sit down, um, write a response to, print it, put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it. Um, and phone calls uh, sometimes tend to get lost as well. Um, emails um, you know, are, are more convenient. And, and one of the questions I get quite a bit is what about mass emails? Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for Jason's head to start nodding because there are days when we're going to get a hundred identical emails uh, encouraging a vote one way or the other. Is that a bad thing? You know, I've got two staff members during a legislative session and we could get a thousand emails in a day when uh, when things are at their peak. If I've got 200 emails that are absolutely identical, I know that people care about the issue and I only have to write one response. Representative Artitai, did you wanna add on? 
Yes, I, I I just want to echo that and my disdain for these group emails, these chain emails. They say the same thing. They just change the who they're from. I can tell you right now that the vast majority of legislators don't even look at those. Once I get like five or six of them in a row, I think they automatically get categorized into the junk email. They're not effective. If you want to reach out to your legislator via email, take the time. If you want us to take the time to read it, take the time to write your own personal message and why it's important to you. If we keep seeing the same email over and over again, look, we're trying to work like this is our work email too. We're trying to respond to, like Natalie said, there's a million issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we want to make sure we're hitting everything we possibly can. But when our inboxes get flooded with hundreds of emails, and this does happen every day, uh, it just I just think your advocacy means more when it has more of a personal touch as opposed to, uh, I'm just going to put my email in and hit the send button. Mm -hmm. You know, Natalie, you touched on this, but I want to emphasize it. Um, the emails that I ignore are the ones that come from um, people I do not represent and don't know. Um, a lot of these uh, these bulk emails, they uh, you you click once on a web page and it is sent to every single legislator. Um, we want to hear from people we represent, and uh, and generally speaking, we don't reply to emails that come to us from out of the district or from, <laughs> and from out of the state. Uh, that happens all the time, but we focus on the folks that we represent. So it's important to be reaching out to the people who are your own legislators. Yeah, great, great point. Great point. Um, and, you know, in terms of crafting your personal message, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But, you know, you don't have to write some, you know, huge novel when you're reaching out to them. Uh, they probably would appreciate it if you didn't and kept it short and sweet since they do have so much correspondence Uh to, to get to. So Scott's going to talk a little bit more specifically about how to craft that message um, so that it is personal in a few minutes. Um, and then just last on the bullets here, uh, you know, I know that social media is where a lot of us get our news and our information. And we tend to kind of be in an echo chamber, right? Because Facebook and Instagram, they know what we care about. So I know when I get on my Facebook, it's all animal stuff, like all the time. Um, but how do we reach people that maybe uh, aren't in that echo chamber with us? Uh, letters to the editor and other opportunities for media attention um, are such a good opportunity to educate the public so that, you know, hopefully you can get uh, other advocates to jump on board with the cause as well. Um, and so letters to the editor are usually, you know, 200 to 250 words that you could submit to your local newspaper um, that can help make a difference in terms of getting the word out there. Um, Keep in mind, whoops, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, one thing that I was really pleasantly surprised about when I uh, started in advocacy was how few phone calls or emails a legislator needs to get to make something a priority. I guess maybe just most constituents aren't taking the time to reach out. So I've heard different numbers, and I'm sure it varies from legislator to legislator and whether it's state or federal. Um, the number that I've heard the most often is it really only takes 10 constituents reaching out to get the representative to take note of whatever issue it is you're talking about. Um, Representative Ortitai, do you have any kind of magic number or does 10 sound about right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's a good rate. Um, it, 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 it Again, it depends on the personal touch, too. It, it can vary. It can be much shorter. Um, it could be longer, too. It just depends on on the relationship. And Representative Gomberg, do you have any, like, you've received X phone calls about this issue, and so it maybe brings it to your attention more so than others? I don't think there's a magic number. Um, sometimes it's the message that resonates. I mean, if somebody writes and draws my attention to something that I immediately understand, I'm immediately concerned about, that's going to become a priority much more quickly than if I, I get 10 or 20 letters that I don't really quite understand on an issue that I'm not familiar with. Um, and I really wish this could go without saying, but I feel like the more and more I interact and get to know people, the more it needs to be said. Make sure you're always polite and respectful. I mean, just think of how you don't want people contacting you at your workplace, yelling and screaming about how you've done a terrible job at something. Um, that's what these people want as well. They want a polite and respectful dialogue. Keep in mind, the goal is to build a long-term relationship. So I don't think there's any legislator on the planet that has voted the way I would like them to on every single issue. We don't always get what we want. 
but we want to make sure that we're welcomed back and are able to continue a long-term relationship with these people. So you're playing the long game, just always make sure to, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Well, Natalie, that's worth emphasizing as well. Um, alienate somebody because they've disappointed you and they're going to remember that. Um, the bills that we count as great successes this legislative session um, are not necessarily new bills. I'm thinking about uh, identifying a state pet introduced uh, four times in the past, getting puppy mill uh, uh, puppies out of pet stores introduced four times in the past, um, working on primate research or or uh, or using animals for cosmetic uh, testing uh, twice before, years in the making. So. Getting angry with somebody is not going to be in your long-term benefit. It's an opportunity if somebody disappoints you to learn more about why they didn't support you this time so you can earn their support next time. Um, you know, the alternative is that uh, that a legislator will show up on a panel like this and uh, and tell you about a, a YouTube video calling him a, a, <laughs> a bigot and a pea brain. <laughs> and it, look, it, look, we're all human. We all get upset. We have off days, but if, if I don't mind if people get upset and people get passionate, I, I love that because it shows me that someone truly cares about their topic. But I, I think first and foremost, to your point, being respectful um, it, it is an absolute must because once you lose that respect and you start getting into name calling and uh, like point your finger in someone's face, then then it's pretty much all over at that point. And also keep in mind, um, you know, if they do do what you want, uh, make sure to send them a thank you. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons over here under public support that I put letters sometimes because I uh, typically try to send legislators that have, you know, done what I've asked them to or even just like a nice holiday card uh, through the mail. So um, that's something that I make the time for. No, Natalie, that's that's a great thing. I've been like over the years, I've gotten a lot of thank you cards. Um, just they don't have to be long letters, just little handwritten notes. I tell you, they mean so much to me. I keep all of them on a board in my office, uh, and when I run out of space, I move them to to shelves. But I'm those have a profound impact, and I remember those people. And when they call and uh, when they come in, and you bet they get treated like royalty when they come to my office. <laughs> Um, and just going back to, I mean, of course, everyone's busy, but, you know, your legislators are no exception. Um, you may need to call or write several times. Of course, we want to be delicate, right? We don't want to be constantly bugging them and, you know, calling or emailing like multiple times a day. Uh, typically, what I like to do when I call or email or when I make uh, contact with the staffers is I establish a timeline for follow up. Um, so, you know, I'll say, when can I expect to hear back about the issue that I'm calling? And if they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with the representative on Friday, then I'll just make a note, you know, the following business day to, to call back then. Um, but you know, you, you do have to be persistent. Um, so let's move on to actually crafting your message. So when you do decide to make the call or send the email, um, what what are the points that you uh, need to to talk about? So Scott, um, I will pass it back to you. Well, yeah. So and and you have to understand that I um, I spent seventeen years as a litigator, um, a lot of courtroom battles, and as a former trial lawyer, I'm inclined to want to cover absolutely every single point. You want to, you know, you're trying to be as thorough as you can, but you can't think that way as an advocate because, you know, you don't have this captive audience like a jury that is not going to be going anywhere. So they just have to listen to you. When you're dealing with legislators, you're dealing with people that are very, very busy, that are trying to manage, you know, probably dozens, if not hundreds of legislative priorities. So the point here is that you want to really, uh, you you want to understand the issue backwards and forwards, in, you know, so that you can answer questions that come up. But when you're making your initial sort of plea or your first, you know, you're, you're, you're having this conversation for the first time, sometimes simple is better. Brief, concise, hitting the main points, and then using that as an opportunity to create questions that then you can sort of go more into uh, into the, the details. But these are just on this slide of a few of the important points. 
um, you know, make sure that you understand, you know, what the bill number is, what the title of the bill is. Um, but, but, you know, having a, a, a concise message, um, especially if you're leaving a message on the phone or with a staffer or with voicemail. And let me give you an example. Um, uh, I, I advocate a lot for wild horses and I do a lot of these trainings like this um, for, uh, for wild horse advocates. And I did every Wednesday, I do a wild horse Wednesday. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, And it's just a little two to three minute vignette about an issue going on with wild horses on our public lands here in the West. And one of the videos that I did that really had the most traction because I think people uh, appreciated it was the basic message if you're going to call, for example, a member of Congress on wild horses, in my view, the best message is this. One, I am a constituent and I am a taxpayer. Two, I support wild horses and burrows on federal public lands. Three, I oppose inhumane helicopter roundups. Four, remove livestock, not wild horses and burrows, from our public lands. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your service and have a great day. That cuts right to the heart of the issue. Um, and there are a million tangential issues around that. And if you if you give that message to a staffer in a congressional office, um, you know, uh, if they are engaged, they are going to pick up on what you're saying and they may ask questions that give you an opportunity to go into more details. But really keeping it really short that you're a constituent and a taxpayer, that right there gives you standing to make this call. And they have to listen to you because, because you're working for them uh, or they're working for you. You, you are the, the voter. You are the taxpayer. So I do think sometimes, especially these first touches with legislators, keeping your message simple and concise and cutting right to the heart of it is probably the most effective and what is going to be the most memorable for them. You're, I think you're on mute. Sorry. I was just asking if either of the representatives wanted uh, to add on to, um, Scott, what you just outlined for us. Well, <clears throat> Scott, again, you're, you're absolutely on point. And, and we talk about the importance of relationships and building a foundation so that when you're there advocating on an issue, it's not the first time that this legislator, your legislator, would have seen your face or heard from you. But but there's another part of this. And, uh, and Natalie, I, I hope I'm not getting ahead of your, uh, your schedule here today, but we deal with thousands of bills. And we're not familiar with all of them. And by necessity, we set up a system where bills go through committees. And the members of those committees, and in particular, the chair of the committee, are the, those are the folks that really decide whether a bill moves forward or whether it just quietly goes off and dies. In Oregon last uh, session, I think we had over 3,000 bills and only about 300 of them move forward. A third of those were budget bills that were necessary for state agencies. Most bills don't go anywhere. So I guess what I'm trying to say, first of all, is that committees are important because those are the people that make the initial decision. And the second thing I would say is that timing is important, that uh, you don't want to, uh, to be talking to somebody before a bill has some life um, um, moving forward and has some momentum. Certainly, you also don't want to uh, reach out to people and encourage their vote the week after that vote was taken. I, I have that happen all the time as well. So uh, timing is important, but also making sure that you're talking to the right people is important. Thank you. Representative Ortitai, did you want to add anything as well? Yeah, just real quickly. It goes back to that, um, the, the point that David had, had made here. Look, when you're reaching out to your rep, all of you who are probably on this call are very passionate about, about issues and you advocate. Um, it's relationship building. The first time you go to meet your, your state rep, you're, you're just, or, or any elected official for that matter, if you, if you get a meeting, you're just getting to know each other. Um, and then you, you set that up for the next time that you're going to have a meeting with them and you can bring up your issues. You can bring up your issues during the first meeting too. It's just a level of comfort 
uh, and just getting to know them because I know that, and I don't want to speak for David, but I'm sure he probably feels similar, but you know, I, I feel more comfortable with someone that I've met with multiple times who's advocating for an issue. There's 5,000 bills in any given legislative session. I am not an expert on any of the ones other than the ones that I personally introduced. That's a lot of bills to know a little about. Um, and when you're coming to me, you're coming to me with specific information about very like a limited number of bills. Maybe it's one, two, or three bills. Um, that's helpful for me because I don't know what's in there. Odds are I probably haven't even read or know that that bill even existed. Um, and just getting that information from you, uh, a trusted source, is really important. Thank you. Um. So we talked a little bit about uh, compelling reasons other than just, you know, the humane treatment of animals. And so uh, if there's any tie-ins that you can make with some of these bills to other issues that, you know, your research has shown that your legislator cares about, um, Scott, do you want to just briefly touch on some other compelling reasons for legislators to support oops, our issues? You're on mute, Scott. I do all my best work on mute. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, th so this is this is, you know, really important because uh, as as it has already been said, you know, not all legislators uh, are passionate about animal welfare, uh, but they're likely passionate about some issue that is touched by the legislation in question. Maybe it's uh, a savings uh, to the taxpayers. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, you can find really compelling issues to support uh, or, or reasons to support a uh, an animal protection measure that has nothing to do with protecting animals. Uh, it could save the taxpayers money. It could protect the environment. Uh, it could just be a matter of government transparency and accountability. So, you know, if you're meeting, for example, with a, a conservative Republican who doesn't have a great record on animal protection, but you know that they have a really strong background on tax policy and responsible government spending and financial responsibility and those kind of things, take that angle, find that angle and really push that, maybe de-emphasize the humane treatment of animals. Um, uh, and likewise, if you've got uh, a member of the legislature who is you know, a real champion for, uh, for transparency, and government responsibility and accountability really push that. Uh, so meet these legislators where they are, meet them on the ground that they are familiar with and that they care about. And that may mean that you drop the rhetoric around being nice to animals or, or taking good care of animals or whatever, and make it about the issues uh, that, that the legislator actually cares about. Thanks, Scott. Okay, we're going to move on to some frequently asked questions. And then, of course, we will get to your questions. Um, so first of all, what legislators should you know? I mean, of course, we're all represented by a, a lot of legislators, right? If you're thinking, you know, like we've got a county treasurer and auditor and all of that. But just, you know, for the kind of 101 class that we're talking about today, um, you know, we have our three representatives in Congress, right? Your one House of Representatives member and then your two senators, um, and then I know in Pennsylvania, I have one state representative and one state senator, but not every state works that way. So you might need to do some research. Um, Scott, is that how it works in Oregon? One state rep, one state senator? Yep, that's right. Great. And then, of course, like I mentioned, you have you know a lot of local people as well. Um, so how do you find who these people are? I mean, it's... If you just Google find my legislators or who are my legislators, there's a lot of sites that come up. I actually took the liberty to go ahead and um, see if I can switch my screen for a moment. Uh, but I just Googled who are my legislators. And of course, you know, your Google screen will probably come up differently. Um, but I like the it's the USA.gov because it is very thorough and pretty user friendly. So I just uh, I'm just making up an address here. So that my address isn't on public record, but I'm just gonna pick a random address in um in Pittsburgh where I live. And oops. so yeah, what I like about this is it breaks it down. So I've got federal, and of course, you know, we see like you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but I see, okay, there's my two US senators. 
and my one U.S. representative, right? So these are Congress people that you would be calling about federal issues. Um, and then, of course, if you're not in Pennsylvania, this might look slightly differently, but I've got a lot of people here. I'm keeping an eye out for my PA state senator and my PA state representative. And those are the people that I would call about state bills. Um, and then, of course, on this website, they give you a lot of local people, too, which we're not really getting into right now. Uh, and so, you know, it's there's other sites, of course, that you can use as well. But this USA.gov is one that I typically recommend. Uh, um, so if you if you click on the information for a federal representative, you're going to see that they have an office in Washington, D.C., and then probably multiple offices at the state level as well. Um, if you call a state representative, like for me in Pennsylvania, they have a Harrisburg office since Harrisburg is our state capital. And then you know, a local office, maybe in Pittsburgh or somewhere. Um, so if you're making a call, um, Representative Orti Tile passes to you. Uh, should you call speaking as a state representative, the the office at the state capitol or local office? Um, I would encourage you to call our local offices. Um, you know, in Pennsylvania, we all have our own district offices and sometimes we have satellite offices, but we also have our Harrisburg offices. But I interact most 90% of the time with my local <laughs> office. Um, so if you leave a message there or you call there, that's your best chance of getting me. And I talk to those people every single day. So please call our lo my local office and in Pennsylvania, call your local offices. Of course, every state is different. I mean, in Oregon, we meet for six months in odd numbered years and for one month in even numbered years. That's when we're in legislative session. And the rest of the time, our offices are empty. Um, and, uh, and we don't have the benefit of having local offices. My uh, legislative office, when we're not in legislative session, is the front seat of my car. Um, so that, that kind of brings me back to whether you want to phone, write, or email. Because if you uh, phone an office and nobody's there, maybe they're checking uh, voicemail every day. Maybe they're checking it once a week. Uh, if you send a, a posted letter, it's going to be picked up by the uh, legislative uh, uh, post uh, department and forwarded back to uh, to your um, your address back in your legislative district, and that can cause you uh, a delay of ten days or more. Um, emails emails are going to go directly to where we are, and so that's going to get to us immediately, whether we're in legislative session or not, whether we're in our district or in our capital office. That's going to be the way I believe that most people are going to get information most quickly. And you can email somebody and ask them to phone you back. Yeah, and just real quick here, I think, you know, David brought up a good point here. Uh, see, Pennsylvania is one of maybe a handful of states that have a full-time legislature. We meet 100, probably 100 days every year. Um, and we have a two-year session. So it's a little bit different in a lot of other states where there's part-time legislatures. Uh, some states meet 30 or 60 days every year. Some meet every other year. It, it is different. So just keep that in mind, depending on which state you're in. So it sounds like as you're building this relationship with your state legislators, you would hopefully get to know what their preference is. Yeah. Um, Jason, I'm going to embarrass you, but this is public record, and I think it's useful for people to get some kind of context. You're a full-time legislator. In Pennsylvania, what does a, a representative get paid every year? So we are now, we, we have now cracked the 100,000 mark. Uh, we're, I believe, at 103. And in Oregon, a legislator gets paid about $33,000 a year, which if you're doing the job full-time like you ought to be, uh, you could probably make more money at Burger King. It, it, and I'm sure the amount of time that you put in um, it makes that number. You'll probably get paid like a dollar an hour at most. <laughs> so if you want to run for office, uh, move to Pennsylvania, not Oregon, yeah. I guess. Pen Pennsylvania, New York, and California, I think, are the three highest paid legislatures in the country. So that's some great perspective perspective on state legislators. Um, Scott, what about members of Congress? Would you recommend people call their Washington, D.C. office or their local office? I think it really depends on on the legislator. I think that um, you know if you can call the local office and um, either either go in and have a face to face conversation with the staff in your local office, uh, or even better, uh, especially if you know that your legislator is going to be in district, 
uh, meeting with that uh, with them face to face in the local office. I think that's great. Um, but I think, you know, um, I usually when I'm calling a member of Congress on on a bill that I care about, uh, just cold calling, I usually call the Washington, D.C. office. I feel like that's a more direct route, uh, especially if I know that the that the lawmaker is uh, there in Washington, D.C. in the middle of uh, of a congressional session. I'll usually call the Washington, D.C. office. But but I also want to say, a lot of members of Congress have these town hall meetings, uh, and and a lot of I think a lot of uh, the state legislators do the same. Those town hall meetings can be an amazing opportunity to address your member of Congress, uh, possibly even have a conversation after the event face to face. But being able to stand up uh, and address them personally, and of course, of course, if you do this. Keep that question nice and short, sweet, and to the point. But being able to publicly address uh, your representative and raise the issue, I think, can be very, very powerful. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, staffers. And so, um, uh, Representative Gomberg, would you maybe speak a little bit to this? Does your does the call or the correspondence uh, matter if they only speak to a staffer? Or what's your advice for dealing with staffers? I think the staffers are the smartest, most effective, most talented people in the office. <laughs> and uh, no, you you are never wasting time talking to uh, to a staff member, um, and you need to uh, treat them with the same respect, the same consideration you would the actual uh, legislator, because they're busy too. They've got a lot going on, and they're trying to handle a lot more details uh, than the uh, the member does. I mean, in general, the, the member has to prioritize and it falls to the staff people to be the generalist and be dealing with everything. Anything to add, Representative Ortiz? Chai? No, that that's all true. Our our staff, they live and breathe this stuff every single day. And look, I'm I'm constantly asked, okay, what phone calls are you getting today? Is there a theme? Is there a specific issue? What do I need to go research? Uh, they're giving me information. And if you upset them, that, that information may never get to me. <laughs> Great advice. Uh, I think we basically covered this question. So in the interest of time, I'll move on to the last one that I have prepared. Um, Representative Ortiz, what happens if you or one of your staffers asks a question, ask a question that the caller or the emailer doesn't know the answer to? Uh, well, that happens quite a bit. Um, it, it, it's it's normal, but we we're usually, hey, we know not everybody knows everything and that's fine. Uh, but usually we're just asking for basic information. Uh, just so we can, so they can pass information along to me. Um, and usually if I'm in person and someone doesn't know, I don't take any offense to that. You don't need to be a master expert on, on, on your issue. Just as long as I know that you're passionate about it. And if you don't know, guess what? We all have, we all have these and we have computers. We can all go look up stuff and, and find more information and get back to me. Um, Cause I certainly don't know everything and I don't even pretend to know everything, but um, Hey, it, it happens, it happens to the best of us. Anything to add representative Gomberg? Yeah, don't make up an answer. Um, don't mislead a legislator. The most important thing that you bring into the office, uh, as important as your passion, is your credibility. And uh, and if you jeopardize your credibility with a uh, incorrect answer because you were trying to wing it, um, you're you're undermining your own credibility. Better to say, I don't know, but I'll get you an answer and be back to you by by email by the end of the week. Thank you. And I just want to underscore one point that I think Representative Gomberg already brought up. But uh, yeah, keep in mind, thousands of bills are introduced, but only a few are actually voted on. Um, and most of them die in committee. So we have to remember that we're really playing the long game here. We have to be persistent, but patient. If you're looking for immediate gratification, then advocating um, for animals legislatively is probably not for you. Uh, so um, I want to thank uh, Representative Ortiz, Ty, Representative Gomberg, and uh, Scott so much for being here and presenting with me today. Um, we have about 10 minutes. So Ryan, um, oh, sorry, real quick. Uh, if you guys have any questions, need anything, um, you know, follow-up materials or whatever, please feel free to email me. My email address is right here and you'll get a recording of this. So if you don't have time to write it down right now, no worries. Um, but Ryan, I'm going to pass it over to you so that you can... Um, get to some of our questions. Sure, we have five questions in queue right now. 
Uh, the first one is, do the principles and methods advocated in this presentation apply to advocating change in city councils and other uh, county commissions? Or are there other approaches more effective at those government levels? Mm. Um, most of my experience is actually working at the local level. So I've uh, worked to initiate and help pass 25 laws in Pittsburgh and some of the surrounding municipalities. Uh, of course, I'll give a chance for our other experts to weigh in, but I think everything does apply. And in fact, I would say relationship building is actually a lot easier at the local level, um, mainly just because these people are dealing with less constituents. Um, and so they're more accessible, typically, in my experience. Um, but please, if anyone has anything to add. Well, I'd say that's a wonderfully perceptive question. And I always say that legislators write budgets and laws, but it's uh, it's local um, local officials that really impact your day-to-day -day life in a much more personal kind of way. Keep in mind that a lot of the things that we deal with at the state level have already been tested at the local level. So you can get an ordinance passed um, in your uh, your city or your county, and that's going to make it easier for us to then extend that to the entire state. Um, you're talking from the perspective of uh, of Pittsburgh. I represent a town. Um, well, I live in a town of ten thousand people, and I represent a dozen towns of between five and ten thousand people. Um, relationships still are important, and you can get a lot more done at the local level than trying to convince the legislature. Anything to add, Scott or Representative Ortitai? I would just say I, I served as the mayor of a small coastal town uh, for several years. And I would say it's it is very much the same. You know, it's especially in a small town, you know, um I, I would have, you know, uh community members come up to me in the frozen food section of the grocery store and start talking to me about their water bill and why why was it so high so you know i mean um you know small town politics um uh, are are really really fascinating i think far more interesting than big city politics but i would say that yes um get to know your local government officials uh, get to know them on a first name basis if you can and really cultivate those relationships because as Representative Gomberg says, uh, sometimes there's a lot more going on at that local level than at the state or federal level. Ryan, what's our next question? Sure. Uh, what do we make of the use of email forms sent from animal advocacy groups? Do we have them in conjunction with the personal uh, relationships or do we not disregard them? I think we talked a little bit about this, but Representative Ortitai, I know you feel strongly about this. So yes, I, I personally don't like them. Um, I, I give you a prime. Last week I got uh, hit up. I, I had 457 emails in the span of two hours uh, on a session day when I'm trying to to vote on like 30 different bills. Uh, that happens quite frequently. I've gotten used to it, but I will tell you again, once I see about four or five of them, I just quickly disregard them so I can get to what I need to. The personal touch is what I'm looking for. Um, Again, I, I know it works. I'm I'm one of 203, and I know it's different across the country. That's just my personal preference. I know a lot of my colleagues agree with that sentiment, but sometimes people, for groups, it feels like they're they're helping, they're helping advocate, helping advance a cause by being in a sheer volume uh, of emails. And sometimes, you know, the the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, but I, I will tell you that doesn't play too far with me. Um, I, I prefer the personal and I will make time if I see an email specifically with a with a nice subject heading uh, from someone who lives in my district, like you get preferential treatment, I will read it, I will personally respond to you, email, call, whatever you want. Uh, but when I see that form, I don't, I, I would say that you're probably not going to get anything from me on that front. And I don't mean that negatively. It's just that when I get 400 of them, I can't respond to everybody. Well, you know, I take a slightly different perspective on that. Um, I don't mind the mass emails. It's it's better than no communication at all. Absolutely, the, the personal touch is strongest and the personal story is strongest. But I get those uh, those mass emails in, like I said uh, a few minutes ago. At least I only have to write a, uh, a response to the letter once. And then my, my staff will keep track of how many times that letter has come in. And they'll send the same response to all of them. So at least it's a little more efficient in terms of, uh, of responding to folks. But yeah, a personal story is always going to be stronger. Ryan, what's our next question? Sure, we have a couple that actually tie into one similar theme of dealing with um, 
bodies that are hostile to your position or perhaps uh, an issue that might be controversial, as one person says, to some, not to us, legislation. How do you handle going about introducing that sort of idea to bodies of politics that might either have a conflict of interest or might not be fully on board with your issue? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll venture what what kind of happens here. You know, th there's a lot of people that I've become friends with who are on the other side of the hour on the other political end of the spectrum. Uh, and to, to be honest with you, I like to get to know everybody on a personal level and no, going in full well, knowing that we're not going to agree on every single issue. And that's OK. We know where we agree and where we disagree. Um, but we have those kind of boundaries, but we will talk about the issues. Like, I, I think that's important is to have an open dialogue. Yeah, I may not be supportive or you may not be supportive of what I want to do or vice versa. That's OK. You know, that's why we have debates. That's why we have conversations. But it goes back to be polite, be respectful. Uh, again, I know things can be passionate and people will have strong feelings one way or the other. But um, you, you just you got it, It's that relationship. Building. I know we keep coming back to that, but that's the important part here. Uh, we're all people. We all have different opinions and different viewpoints, but we can all agree. We can sit down and have a conversation and debate the merits of what your issue is. You know, there's another part to that as well. If you have that relationship and maybe I like you, but I can't agree with you on this one. That's going to give me just a little bit more reason to agree with you next time when maybe I'm on the fence. All right. Uh, build those relationships. Be respectful. And again, remember, it's a long game. Most of the good bills we passed in Oregon this year were not here for the first time. In some cases, four different times, four different sessions before we got them to the finish line. And that's that's an important part he brings up, too. In Pennsylvania, on average, it takes six years, three sessions to get a piece of legislation done. Ryan, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. We'll have one quick question here. Uh, the committee complaint forms going to the Senate or Congress, et cetera, is that effective at all? Scott, would you like to take that one? I'm not sure what they mean, um, you know, but again, I think if, if it's a form, I think, uh, you know, a, like a form email or a form complaint or something, I think you just have to be circumspect about that. And I think going back to what the two representatives have said, uh, a personal touch is going to be far more compelling. Um, anything to add, Representative Ortiz or Gomberg? Well, I know we're getting ready to wrap things up. Um, I just want to touch on something, and that is the campaigns. We're getting ready to move into the campaign season. Everybody uh, loves campaigns and hates campaigns, but it's a lot easier to work with a legislator who already agrees with your perspective than it is to try to convince somebody who comes in with a completely different attitude. Campaigns are an invaluable opportunity to build those relationships we've been talking about and also to uh, to get a head start on passing legislation by electing people that are positively inclined toward the things we're trying to accomplish. And I'll just add real quickly onto that too on the, on the campaign side and the the actual getting elected. I, when look when I first ran for office almost ten years ago, you know I didn't really know anything about humane issues, animal issues at all. And I will tell you, uh, going through that elective process really helped me. Uh, and after winning the election, having people like Natalie come into my office and her colleagues and and constituents come in and like really educate me about a topic I didn't know much about was so impactful. Uh, it has led me down a completely different legislative path than I ever intended when I ran for office. So uh, they, when you go through that political process, it's a good time to vet your candidate. But I will tell you, nine times out of 10, if you just meet with them after they're elected too, uh, and you educate them, it'll go a long way. And it look, I, I Natalie, I think I've known you now for for my entire time in office, mm -hmm. nine years. And every time that Natalie calls me, she gets a return call, a text, email, whatever she wants, Natalie gets because she came in, was nice to me, <laughs> advocated for her issue politely, respectfully, uh, and has become a friend over that. So I, I encourage that type of behavior. Yeah, thank you. And you're not even my representative. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Representative Orti Tai, Representative Gomberg, and uh, Mr. Beckstead uh, for being here today. Thank you to Ryan for um, being our tech guru. And thank you all for coming and uh, you know indulging us and in learning more about 
um, advocacy. And as I mentioned, this was recorded. So uh, you will receive this in your email and please reach out with any questions that you may have. But uh, thanks again.